in this uh, concluding session of the Connect Conference for 2013. I hope you don't get too warm with the fireplace going in here for our fireside chat, but uh, imagine, if you will, bear with us. Uh, we have a chance here to, to visit with Jonathan Grayer. Jonathan is the current CEO of Weld North. It's a private equity firm that's the uh, owner of Learning House, among other properties. Jonathan is the uh, former CEO of Kaplan Inc. He was one of the uh, youngest CEOs in America when he took over Kaplan low these many years ago, built it into one of the largest educational services companies in the world, and now he's leading the Weld North organization. So uh, good to have a chance to visit with him about uh, his views on online education and what's the opportunities and challenges facing us. So Jonathan, we did a survey, second year in a row we've done this at the Learning House of online college students. And one of the significant findings for me was that 25% of the students that are pursuing online degrees are traditional college age students. These are people 18 to 24 and they're just skipping the campus to go right to college online. Any advice for, the, for faculty or provost administrators here in the group that are working with these students, how do we respond to that phenomenon? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, say thanks for, for, for being here and for waiting for me until the end. I, I need to pull some strings next year and get my booking agent to uh, get me a better time slot than the last day <laughs> on a fireside chat on the 94 degree day in Louisville. But um, I think I know who to talk to. Um, and uh, and uh, I will be here next year, and I will have a different time slot. <laughs> uh, Dave's question about the first kind of large segment of students that is opting out of uh, or opting out of the traditional brick and mortar educational experience to go straight to online. Um, is a phenomena that's only beginning. And it's beginning for the simple reason that va the value proposition of the traditional choice is really for the first time in American history coming under question. The issue used to be, do I have enough money to go to two or four year uh, college experience? Because if I do, it's worth it to me. It's worth it to me for my future earning stream it's worth it to me for my self-esteem. It's worth it to me in my family setting and how they think about it. I mean, there was nothing more prestigious to, to be able to say, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And that was a, an, a badge. Well, if you look at those three drivers, the value proposition itself, the notion that it will be paid for, or money is available through grants and, and scholarship. And, and third, the uh, belief that it was a, a badge to wear. All those things are coming under question. And what you're starting to see is a much more rational decision about how to most efficiently capture both the learning and the degree that goes along with that learning. And those are two fundamentally different phenomena. How are students? learning and how are they acquiring an accredited degree. And we could open up the mic and get into a very kind of cool conversation about that divergence of motivation. Because clearly the for-profit explosion of the 90s and 2000s was driven by a older student who had either tried and not succeeded or had some very difficult personal challenges during their 18 to 24 year old period saying, I don't really care about how much I learn. What I really care about is getting a fully accredited degree. And the first four profit institutions cared a lot about the educational experience. But as the populations grew so dramatically, it became very much about the fully accredited degree. What you're now seeing is an age shift, but the same phenomena. And the age shift is to younger students who um, 
because they're younger, because funds are available, and because uh, they're uh, of a generation that grew up with technology, they're willing to do exactly what that older population was doing, which is to get a fully accredited degree as efficiently as possible. All institutions are going to have to grapple with that. So that 25% is going to grow, and there's nothing that's going to stop that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this explosion that happened about 15 years ago when uh, many, many people, older adults, working adults, had the opportunity because the technology enabled it to go to school online. And we saw this massive uh, influx of students. It hit the for-profits first primarily. They took advantage of that. They were ready, they were out there and were able to meet that need. And uh, now they've started to decline somewhat have a tough time meeting those same enrollment goals. And many of the institutions in this room are moving into that space, are offering online degrees, uh, following that model, it's been successful. We heard a, a gentleman yesterday who runs a university that's got thousands of students online. He was in there early and was able to capitalize on that. So for these institutions that are maybe starting or have smaller online programs, uh, is there a cautionary tale here that, that the times have changed, that there's, that opportunity is closing? Will they hit that same wall that the for-profits hit maybe in a year or two, and how do they prepare for that? Just for the record, how many questions was that? One question, <laughs> a lot of lead-in. <laughs> David, I want my fee doubled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's... The, I, I, Let's start, uh, cautionary tale, absolutely. But what's the caution? The caution about the for-profit explosion was not um, what happened in 98 through 2005. It's what happened after that um, when really the gap financing, for those of you who were in the business then, went away as an inhibitor uh, of getting into school. So I see Jim Dunway. You, so there, there had to be equity in the equation, at least a real bank loan called, what was called gap financing. And, the, and when it became so profitable to make these uh, government back loans that the institution, the, 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 the large banks that were making the gap loans started giving that money away for free or underwriting uh, that risk without worrying about the repayment there was an explosion of the population willing to take on this amount of debt. We can talk about why, and I think there's a question I, I know Dave wants to ask me about the financial bubble, student debt bubble, we should address that. But yeah. what started happening was that for-profits were educating more students than they could help find good jobs in the fields of study. And that's really where the cautionary uh, tale um, exists, and it's a much larger socio-economic question, and that is most higher education in this country has always been, um, even though it's transformed over time, uh, nothing but paraprofessional and professional education. Now, there are a small number of institutions that have been able to be liberal arts institutions their entire existence because they are really uh, sourcing and, 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 and sorting the highest achievers. But those students are graduating with liberal arts degrees and going on to be very uh, uh, well-established uh, adults earning a lot of money. So the caution is if you are educating students in a field of study and do not believe that they will have gainful employment in either the nation if you're a national online institution, but to this, this room where I think uh, uh, is much, a much better situated uh, group of institutions within your geographical sphere of, of influence, then you are moving in the direction that the for-profits um, went to. Uh, so what's that mean? That means you should grow your businesses to the size that you can educate them well, deliver a product you're proud of, and they can take that degree you, that education and the accredited degree that you're able to give them and go get a better job than they could have before she or he entered your institution. To, when you expand beyond that size, 
you are moving in the direction of the for-profits, where you have students who've taken on large amount of debt, who have taken time off from the workforce, have accumulated bills, and that, that uh, add to their financial burden because they haven't been earning as much money, even if they have a second job, and then they're not able to use their, their, their investment uh, or deploy those skills in a better, in a better earning capacity. So that, that would be the cautionary, the mm -hmm. cautionary tale. As far as nonprofits and publics taking the place of for-profits, um, clearly, uh, anyone who cares about the future of this country should want the best product delivered at the lowest price available to all students. And whoever can do that mm -hmm. should be um, the, 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 the most prevalent form of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the institution. So I don't think it really matters what your tax status is. What matters is the quality of your, your program, the price a student pays, and what happens to her or him when they're done. And obviously, the for-profits have a lot of disadvantages that, that were, were not exposed until recently. We can talk about that. So um, I'm all for it because I'm much more interested in the public outcomes than I was earlier. I might have had a different view earlier in my career, but we can get to that if you want. Yes, yeah, so let, let's talk about the debt bubble. Is there really a debt bubble? And is it going to blow up on us like the housing crisis? Is this too big a group to use swear words? Uh, no. I think it right. might be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there a, um, I'm trying to think about what, how, what acronym my daughters use when texting to give the right answer. But yes, it's not a debt bubble, it's a debt crisis. What is the crisis uh, driven by? Well, before you get to the debt crisis, you have to get hard at the value proposition of higher education in this country for most students, not all students. And if you look at that in a very simple ROI perspective, how much is invested both in, in, in money and in lost earnings to get a degree that allows that student to then go on and prosper. You look at a very uh, tale of two cities. The highest achieving um, students are just fine. So are the students who have very uh, focused education very specific. If you're an x-ray technician and you get a good education, you will go out and earn a good living and you're not going to have a debt problem. Ironically, back to the original vocational education movement, which was the other side of the GI Bill in this country, trade school uh, students who do well, who have shorter programs and get very specific uh, accreditation and certification, truck mechanics, I mean, you can go down the list. Also, not a problem. If you go to, you know, we're talking to, to folks in the Minnesota area, you go to Carleton College, you don't have a problem. You don't have a, also, so that, those are the two generic groups that don't have a problem. In the middle, um, it's very uh, uh, evident that there are some institutions, hopefully ones that we're helping, that have missions to educate students in a geographic dispersion for specific communities that understand how they're being trained and want them employed in their areas. And those students, I think, will also thrive. If you're not in one of those three groups, it's hard to see how the cost of higher education in this country can be rationalized by uh, the output of having made that investment. And because of that, the debt that's taken on by all those students who are not in one of those three groups, elites, very targeted education or very geographically targeted. Um, they're not, those students are not able to service their debt. Now, the fundamental reason for that is that there's been no market mechanism really in place to lower prices um, of, of higher education. So we have allowed debt to finance an oligarchic pricing structure that has led to this the, the, the problem that we have. What is the solution is, I think, a tougher question. And, and, and clearly in this country, um, the lack, we'll get into technical 
description, but the inability to get rid of your student debt. And the same way that we have solved the, the housing crisis in this country is the big elephant in the room going forward. How are we going to free students who are, you know, or free people who are students in programs that, that have been, been, you know, shackled with a debt load that they'll never get out from under? And uh, that's a historical problem. I think going forward, there's going to be lower priced options that will lower, the, uh, decrease the problem. But right now, that's a huge problem for mm -hmm. our country. One of the ramifications that for these kind of institutions that we work with is price. Mm -hmm. How do you set your price? I was had a conversation recently with this president of a state university about pricing. I'd made the comment in a presentation that uh, it's cheaper to offer degrees online. And he wanted to take me to task over that. He was arguing with me. They did this big study, and it was more expensive to offer online classes. And as I queried this gentleman, I figured out that he wasn't adding in the cost of the campus. He was just looking at instructional delivery and was kind of setting aside the whole infrastructure of the campus when he said it was, it was more expensive online. It's clearly cheaper when you do online versus on ground if you have to pay for the campus and the classroom and so forth. But there's a bind here because you got the campus. You have to deal with it. Many of the institutions that we work with are building their online enrollments, and they're keeping the same price. It's very common. The most common uh, pricing strategy is the same price for an online class as an on-ground class. But you know you're making a lot more money at the end of the day on those online classes. Any advice on how? policy or the leaders of these institutions should think about how to price that and do you have two different prices for this in a sense for the same college degree? Well that's the, the so what of the question, the same college degree. If your students are getting the fully accredited degree that your institution grants, it is almost impossible to think about um, a bifurcated pricing structure without causing enormous campus problems. And, and, and one way to really think about the opportunity is to use large online enrollments to average down the true cost of uh, the experience, thereby being able to make your brick and mortar tuition price more competitive. Because what is ahead is price competition in nonprofit and public education. That is coming. Um, and so the institutions that are able to lower their expense base by actually using online education of all kinds, either for the, the degree itself or extension school, auxiliary learning program, so that it uh, supplements or reduces the cost of the overall experience because um, there's no doubt that the institution is defined by the buildings and the brand and the place. And so uh, the online programs are going to be driven off of that experience and there's nothing wrong with the self-selection of students that choose online, making it effectively cheaper to go to the campus-based program. The second way to think about it is the blended learning evolution and how that defines pricing. That that is the place where you can begin to think about pricing some of your programs differently. Where if someone is an enrolled uh, student on campus, if they opt to take some of their programs online, there are pricing implications that can, can be worked out. But I do think that the most successful institutions in the future are going to be ones that use uh, that think about the revenue the institution gets and in, in segmented ways using the more profitable students to lower the overall price of going to the school. Because online only institutions are going to have a very hard time competing against well-run hybrid institutions. Poorly run brick and mortar institutions are going to eventually not make it. Now, because I'm at the end, I'm told I'm supposed to say some things to keep you awake, so I want to repeat that. <laughs> Online-only institutions are going to have a very hard time surviving. 
institutions that don't innovate with hybrid programs and a variety of modalities are going to thrive. And those that are just brick and mortar, unless they're elite, elite. And, and in that, that is really less about the education than about the brand. Now, the brand was informed by the education, but that's a, you know, my institution, my alma mater has been at it, you know, we're working on 400 years. So it's very hard to catch up in that regard. You need a lot of money. So short of that, you have to, you know, the game is, it is a pay it forward game. You can't hold your position and think that, that uh, in a, in, in, on a percentage basis that's going to that's gonna work. The pricing issues right now shouldn't get in the way of that. And that's why I'm really not for different pricing structures by, 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 by modality. So I, as I heard you respond, though, that you think that sometime in the not too distant future, prices will start to come down. And if institutions are smart, they'll use that online revenue blend it in and bring the price institution down. Well, I mean, higher education is going to follow the, the laws of nature, right? Efficiency is going to drive lower costs, and lower costs is going to drive lower prices, and lower prices are going to drive better value. It, it is a very hard thing for a college president to lower prices. We well, have one client well, institution well, in the room know, here today. In, in, let's just face it, in this industry, lowering prices is not raising prices. Right, uh, uh, you can just let your, 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 your competitive institutions raise their price more than you, and over a number of years, you're going to be a much the lower price. end. Yeah. yeah, I don't think anyone, well, I think that there will be uh, institutions that have real struggles and are forced, like in any competitive marketplace, to lower price uh, irrationally to try to, to try to get students. And, and again, while that might be a faculty issue, if, if, if the balance sheet of the institution requires it, you're going to see some institutions doing that. I don't think it will be successful because discounting education in our, in our, in our country has never been a, a winning, a winning right. strategy. But not raising prices is more what I'm talking about. Okay. So uh, faculty members and presidents and, and uh, educational leaders love to talk about the mission of the university. It's kind of holy ground. And it's kind of crass to talk about brand. Mm -hmm. How do brand and, and mission fit together here? And how should these people think about that so that uh, it's, it's a win-win or it's a positive well, combination? Well, I don't, I don't see them as mutually exclusive co concepts. I think that the brand of an institution is driven uh, by the mission set by the, the, the president and and the, and, and the trustees and the, and, and, and the alumni and the, the legacy of the place. Um, but I don't think that educational institutions, brands are any different than any other consumer brand. Um, the name of the institution, the symbols of the institution, the color of the, insti of the, of the logo, of the, of the way it communicates, all send signals to potential students and to faculty and to partners about what that institution's values are what their goals are, and um, those missions are all being um, stressed uh, by the changes we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And very few institutions are not going to are going to be able to not um, change a, some of their mission to meet the demands of the marketplace. Um, I had an advisory meeting with um, the head of one of our armed forces universities who told me that they didn't have to change their mission. And I think he had a point. I mean, you know, that's how extreme you have to get. If you're, if you're an uh, armed forces institution, your, 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 your mission is pretty well defined. But even the most elite universities are changing uh, the notion of what their brand needs to mean in, in the world we're describing. But I don't think that brand and branding for a, a, a university, a college, um, is a, is, a, is a dirty concept. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to a small town that has a proud institution like many of the ones represented in the room, that brand is very powerful. It's powerful to the people who, who work there, who, who feed the people who go there, who do the real estate deals that sit around the, 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 the uh, location, who, who uh, uh, provide the civil and civic uh, services. So. Um, I think that it's, a very, it's a very comfortable concept. It just, the notion of profitability of students is 
the real problem. It kind of crosses that line. Yeah. Yeah, that, we, that was reiterated in the survey that we did again this year. Most of these online students pick a local institution. 70% of them attend a school within 100 miles, and it's the brand, I think, that right. makes it attractive to them and holds them in. Okay, so. Well, I want to say, the reason that I was so interested in Learning House when we bought it is exactly this notion. It is my belief that there will be elite national universities and there will be potent local brands. And those local institutions are going to serve a very specific need. They're going to train students in a geography as to widely defined as the president is able to define it, that go to that school because there's pride and history and continuity, and then they're going to work in that same geography. But if you go to a mediocre school that doesn't really serve your, uh, your professional needs far away, and then you have to try to think about getting a job, very hard to do that. So I think that in an efficient marketplace, it's going to evolve towards elite universities, potent state universities, and local colleges serving a, a professional educational need for students who decide that what's best for them is to get a higher education degree near home because they want to work near home and they want to make a good financial investment uh, in doing that. And that's why Learning House and what David and his team were doing was so interesting to me as, a, as an owner. One question left. Last question. You've, you've uh, led educational services companies that service the K-12 market as well as higher ed. And uh, I'd like to hear you comment on what we in higher ed can learn from the K-12 space. Are there some lessons there that we could pay attention to some ideas we could take to use to our benefit. Hmm. We can have questions after this. Or we're going. No, we're going to. We're not going to do Q and A from the audience. This okay. is this is your last chance to wrap it up and make. Your well, I would. I, I. You know. The, the 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 question can go in. You know, four or five directions. Some more controversial than others. And. Um, I would love to hear from the audience on this, on, on, on this answer. The largest obstacle for change in the K-12 marketplace is the struggle between management and labor, right? between the people running schools and the unions representing the workers in the school. And it's a national, at, at the national level, it's, it, it's, a, it's a huge issue, and at the local level. Uh, it's even a bigger issue. Um, to get around those challenges, innovators and entrepreneurs have started alternative schools. And all of your states have an opinion about charter schools and about the movement of, of getting around um, that, that, that struggle. But as in any struggle, there is no right and, no, there, there, are, there are right and wrong perspectives on both sides. And some of the best teachers are ardent union members. And some of the, you know, uh, the, big, the, the, the biggest uh, obstacles are, 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 are principals and administrators. So when you look at the higher ed environment, can you make that analogy between the administration and the faculty? And as I said when I started, I would love to hear your views on that because I don't want to make the statement. But clearly, you could see how it could evolve, and it is evolving and is a real issue, right? That, that the people responsible for paying the bills and keeping the lights on and, and innovating and making lab money available have to think about things differently than, than the women and men who are teaching the curricula and doing the syllabuses and holding the students accountable for a level of achievement that day and that week and that month. And innovation becomes very difficult when you put those two forces together. The solution in K-12, through which we're very much a part of and very excited about, is the use of technology to deliver education. So think about the flipping of the classroom, of using computer-based and digital learning programs to allow students to go at their own pace, to learn anytime, anywhere, to allow parents to become active participants in that process. All that is coming, um, and it is coming at the 
I could go on a long time about this. So, you know, they might have to ha hold the sign up in the back. But it's coming uh, with the demise of the textbook, which was, or is, a very specific and very closed end system for how to teach. It's finally arriving after years and years of struggle where the classroom with what's called the Common Core Standards, which are coming in 2014, all bets are off and change is really here. Now let's flip over to the world that you live in. Online learning and the digital textbook, if you will, are um, cousins, but they're not siblings. Because there is no question that in an online learning experience, the teacher is as much the center of the experience as she is in a classroom. If you've ever sat through an unengaging online instruction, you know how I mean, the price is right is better. I mean, you sit there and, you, and there's no, it just, it's just mind-numbing. And the skills required to teach a quality online course at the college level are, are very significant. The whole training aspect of it, I would love to hear how you guys are thinking about that, but it's a whole different skill set. And the best institutions are going to think a lot about how to train their instructors um, to be online uh, competent. I don't believe that the online delivery of online uh, education will ever compromise the model itself. K-12 model is going to go through an enormous change. One is, uh, to kind of say it another way, the higher ed challenge is a modality challenge. That it is more efficient and effective to use an online distribution of what is a very effective way of learning um, as opposed to in the K-12 world, we are literally going to dismantle. You're going to see a dismantling of the way the Roman model of third grade. And it's going to become an, a much more self-paced, individualized experience with a coach in the form of a teacher who is helping each student through an acquisition of skills, especially in early, in early days. And so I would say that the, center, the central challenge to both is the way management and labor are able to work together. And in the K-12 space, um, as you might have, for those of you who follow this closely, in New York, $500 million of teacher training money was held up for six months before the governor had to come in and order the mayor to give the money up because of a battle between the teachers and the principals about how that money was going to be used. Because they wanted it, the teachers wanted it to be for more teachers, more individuals getting more jobs, and management wanted it to be for curriculum that would, all the things I just described. In higher ed, this issue is alive and well. And I'm sure at your institutions, the administration and faculty do not see eye to eye yet on how to do this. And I think the winning institutions are going to be the ones that are able to collaborate and able to find a shared ground quicker than their competitors. And their competitors are the ones that they're competing with, either at a national level, if they're an Ivy League institution or a great state university, or at a local level within the trading zone of, um, of the student base that they're, they're describing. So I think that the, the, the commonality is does management and labor work together or work against each other? And institutions that break out in that regard are going to win, just as public uh, education systems that do. And there are some that are doing better than others. Um, so that would be hmm. the answer. But there's like so much more to talk about, isn't there? There is. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to bring this to a close. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with You're us, welcome. for being here. Thank all of you for participating in Connect 2013. This has been a stimulating, enlightening opportunity for me. I hope it has been for you. Many sessions I attended, people were engaged in contributing and sharing. Our whole purpose in, in putting on this conference is to help people like you that are building these programs learn some new ideas, get some input from your peers, leave here with a fresh set of ideas or motivation to go solve some of these problems and get people educated.
So thanks for coming. We'll see you next year at this time. Please fill out the survey form that you'll get in, in your email later on today or tomorrow and give us feedback about how we can improve the conference. Thank you for coming. I admire what you all do. Good luck in the next year. I'll see you here next year. Thank you. Thank you.